Okay, so th thank you very much, everybody. We're gonna start the class. Uh, for those of us that are watching this, uh, okay, so uh, I'll share my screen and we'll see here. Uh, We'll, we'll see here. Uh, we'll see here uh, the listening section again. That's something very important, the listening section. Okay, so. Uh, So here we have, uh, as we said, we're going to review this very, very quickly. Uh, we have three, the four lectures. Then we have six questions each. We'll have a total time of 41, the 57 minutes. That's something it depends on the number of uh, questions that we have. We're going to review this very quickly. We have two conversations. The three conversations will have five questions each. And here it says no slangs. We didn't see that, but no slang, no slangs means that there is no, uh, there is no. Uh, in español es uh, como slang es la manera típica de hablar de hablar de alguna ciudad o de alguna población. Entonces no existe eso. Okay, so we we've already seen that. Um, I'm gonna very quickly review this. So we have 41 minutes, as we said, that's uh, for the AM scored listening section. Uh, sorry, that's when we don't have an AM scored listening section. That's when we probably have the AM scored reading section, okay? So uh, uh, that's, that's the thing. So uh, let's continue. So, uh, we have only 60 minutes to respond, actually, not very long time. So then we have, as we said, three question types. There is the main idea question type. There's also the function and organizational question type. And there's also the attitude and inference question. And depending, it will probably be 80% attitude and inference questions. We'll probably have one function and organizational, and we'll probably have one main idea question. Okay, so this main idea is actually the first question after we've risen to the passage that asks about the main idea of the conversation that we have function and organizational that could be like, why does this person say this? And then you get to listen again, the idea that we have or probably it will be about an organization, like how the lecture is structured. And if you don't have those, it'll, it'll be definitely uh, attitude or inference questions. Okay, so as we said, uh, there are many, many attitude and inference questions in the listening section. So of course it could be attitude, like why that, why, uh, Sorry, how is that said, or what is the context of the conversation, or uh, what is the woman's attitude uh, towards sex, or something like that in terms of attitude, or it could be inference questions uh, where you need to figure out information that is not said. Uh, from the lecture, what can be inferred about X? What does the professor imply when he says this? What will the student probably do? Which of the following is most likely to happen or have certain characteristics, okay? So uh, those are uh, types of questions in terms of inference questions. And as we said, uh, this is the timing, okay? So I wanted to very quickly review the reading and listening timing that we have for each of these section, depending uh, on uh, and having an extra underscore reading or an extra underscore listening section. 
So here we'll see uh, here we'll see how to register for the TOEFL exam. Uh, we need a and that's something very important. Okay, so today we'll see after reviewing this, we are gonna see how. Actually, we are gonna do uh, this. Uh, we're gonna do a practice, and then we'll and then we were gonna do this uh, step by step registration. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the registration. How can we do the registration? Okay, so in order the, in order to register to the test, we're gonna go to this address, okay? I'm gonna copy that. And uh, we're gonna first need to create an ETS account. Primero tenemos que crear una cuenta ETS. Okay, uh, acá por ejemplo, uh, create an account create an account. Here we're gonna have our personal information. So first, or given name. That means your ID. Like uh, if you are, uh, si tiene un nombre en español, por ejemplo, Roberto Francisco Pérez Medina. Sí, entonces lo más importante es poner el primer nombre, que sería en este caso Roberto. Sí, in this case, uh, we're gonna do my name, Marcelo Fernando, so it's Marcelo. Okay, I don't need to put Fernando. No necesito poner Fernando, okay? Uh, last name. In my case, is Gamboa Torres. Tengo dos apellidos, entonces, eh, bueno, en este caso voy a poner ambos. Okay, uh, here I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put a, a different date. Voy a poner una fecha de nacimiento al azar, qué sé yo. Okay, so uh, after that we're gonna select gender, uh, an email address. I'm gonna put an email address here. It could be whatever. Uh, actually, we're seeing here, uh, we're seeing here how how to go to the website and how to make the registration. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to put an address here. It will be an email address that I put. Uh, and uh, OK, so I'll put here an email address. It will probably be something like I'll get an email address here. OK, so here you have. Then I'm gonna select the country. I don't know. In this case, I'll put Argentina. Address. I don't know, it could be like whatever. And then I'm gonna put a number. Okay, here I'm gonna put a number, so it could be like, uh, it could be like, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm gonna hit next here. I'm gonna put uh, the country where I was born. Actually, acabamos de poner el país donde nacido. Native language. Um, 
tree. So here, uh, no thanks. Username. Aquí tenemos que crearnos un usuario. Una pregunta de seguridad. Okay, so, uh, acá reviso todo, envío la información, ok, y eh, acabamos de crear la cuenta, estamos acá aprendiendo, solo que Armando tal vez ya no necesita. Sorry, I was late, sorry. No, no problem, so, uh, 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 Okay, so here we have a, an ETS account. We need a, uh, okay, so it's created. And then after I created the account, I sign in, le doy a uh, hacer sign in y después de eso, uh, we're going to go to uh, IBT, podemos acá registrarnos para el home edition. Okay, tenemos para home edition o test center. Podría ser home edition. Tenemos que verificar nuestro mail. Seleccionamos la fecha. Y después de ello, puede ser una fecha cual sea, el 20 para home edition, no hay mucho problema. Un horario. Y después de eso, básicamente tenemos que pagar, aclarando que todo esto se hace a través de, eh, de eh, a través de eh, todo esto se hace a través de el internet del home edition y todo esto también eh, por ejemplo para lo que es el home edition es muy aconsejable el tener un documento de identidad que nos permita tener el nombre y el número en, el, en la misma página. Eh, por ejemplo, un pasaporte. He escuchado de gente que he tenido alumnos que eh, teniendo una, un carnet que tiene el, el nombre y el número, eh, uno, al, uno en la parte frontal y otro en la parte inversa, no han podido registrarse, han tenido que requerir de su pasaporte para hacerlo, así que siempre hay que tenerlo eh, relativamente listo, el pasaporte. Y, eh, bueno, hay que tener eso, hay que poner el, el número y con eso vamos a darle next. Acá vamos a poner, por ejemplo, un pasaporte. Podemos enviar, ojo, estos scores a alguna universidad que quisiéramos aplicar, hasta cuatro. Tenemos que averiguar el código de eh, recipiente. Eso es buscando en la universidad a la que estamos aplicando. 
Marcel, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Do you recommend to send the the scores uh, to the universities, or after you can see your score, your final score? It's uh, uh, it's uh, it's very very recommended that you send it before. Okay. Why? Because you can always, if you don't get the score, you can always take it again. So it's there is no problem if you don't like. If you need a ninety and you you get an eighty, it's like you you can take it, take it again. And if you have a hundred, there is no problem. You know, okay. You can take the TOEFL as many times as you want, and there is no university that will say, no, you re, you, you 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 didn't approve the first okay. time. So that's why we're not a we're not receiving your document. So there's no problem. Actually, it's better because if you don't have this, uh, if you don't put the, the codes here, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't put the codes here, uh, they'll charge you if you want to send them. Uh, after the exam. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's right. So it's better that you put the codes here so that, and even to universities yeah, that you will probably not get there, you know, mm -hmm. because if you send them uh, anyway, it will be better okay, because okay. they'll have it so it doesn't matter okay so it's okay. it's very important so i would definitely uh, advise you to put all the universities because that was a mistake that i made actually i didn't put anything and I, I thought after that that it was not a very very smart uh, to do so so after that we can we can uh, buy these uh, packs in order to to have uh, various PDFs and everything else. Podemos compararnos estos PDFs. Bastante interesantes. Uh, vamos a ver un poco estos temas de, de, de lo que tienen. Existe igualmente, sí, estos eh, practice online que te da el score. Eh, inmediatamente te lo, te lo reviso en la computadora hasta la parte del speaking entonces eh, es bastante fiable francamente yo lo tomé entonces eh, eso se puede hacer ¿no? para ver qué tan, qué tan bien estamos según el propio TOEFL entonces acá eh, acá tenemos TOEFL Exclusive the Guide Ok, todo lo que se compra acá es online, ya no hay estos programas. Uh, se puede comprar acá, hay libros de igual manera. Y el precio es, depende, pero en este caso es 185, que se pague en la página. Entonces, para todos los que están viendo igualmente la grabación, si se paga en la página es algo que vale, si es que es de otra institución, a no ser que sea la institucional, entonces normalmente, eh, normalmente no, eh, no, no, no es una buena idea. Ok, so, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, as we said, we need to create an account, we select the date and location of the test and you'll get a confirmation. Ok, so it's safe, the pay with credit card, it's like, uh, $180 or 185 and uh, and you'll get your scores. Uh, it says here about a month, but actually it comes uh, way faster than that. Uh, last time I got my score in, I think it was four days and it wasn't even the home edition. So you'll expect to get your scores very, very quickly. Okay, so, so the speak the speaking is uh, like reviewed by by a computer or by a person? No, no, no. The speaking in the TOEFL is by a person. But okay. you can buy here. There are some things that I showed. Uh, acá en la página puedes mm -hmm. comprar eh, algunos TOEFLs que son como unos online. Así que uno puede comprar desde acá. Ahora voy a mostrar donde hay sí es. Eh, Eh, ahí, ahí sí te lo, te lo, por ejemplo, estos de acá, ¿no? Que son Online Practice Volume 31. Entonces cuesta 29 dólares y es como un, eh, es como un eh, TOEFL que lo das en línea 
grabas y eso te lo devuelve la computadora. Y okay. se te aclara de que el resultado puede variar, qué sé yo. Entonces, eh, bueno, o sea, realmente, pero no varía tanto, ¿no? O sea, por ejemplo, me parece un buen, buen elemento para practicar, sí, en el sentido okay. de saber cuánto es el score, eh, okay. pero no obstante, eh, más o menos, digamos, no varía tanto, por ejemplo, unos, no sé, 5 puntos, 10 puntos, es un, porque es una computadora, digamos, ¿no? Pero eh, creo que ha estado mejorando mucho, antes era con un bot que te lo calificaba inmediatamente. Ok. Entonces es bastante, bastante interesante, tal vez es bastante recomendable el poder verlo. Ok, so after that, uh, after that, we're going to see... Uh, We're going to practice. So, so uh, Abigail or Armando, do you have any question about listening or reading until here? No. No, until here, no. Okay, Abigail? No? No. Okay, so uh, today we're going to practice how to take notes in the listening. Okay, so please prepare a piece of paper. Okay, mm -hmm. por favor, preparen una hoja de papel y doblenla en, eh, como habíamos dicho, vamos a practicar. No es para el home edition, mm -hmm. es para el... Eh, ahora tal vez, hermano, como vas a ver, el home edition tienes un plástico, una, tal vez puedes practicar ahí. Ajá. Pero, Abigail, eh, si pudieras vos tener una hoja, eh, la normal, doblarla, como habíamos dicho, entre cuatro, del horizontal, vertical, y vamos a practicar, eh, por favor, sin escribir las... Eh, las vocales, ¿sí? sin escribir las vocales, ok, trataremos de practicar de esa manera, ok, entonces vamos a ver a custom practice. Ok, I'll give you Two minutes to prepare. Por favor, dos minutos para prepararse. Okay, so we're gonna start. So please, Abigail, cameras on, everybody. Okay, so we're gonna start. Vamos a empezar de esta manera. Listen to part of a lecture in a class on environmental studies. Often, when we think about deserts, we imagine vast, uninhabitable wastelands that are basically, um, well, uninhabited. But actually, Dry lands comprise over 40% of the earth, and over 2 billion people across the globe live within these very tough ecological zones. The, the scarcity of water is a huge issue for any population, big or small. And to survive, people in dry lands, uh, these kinds of societies often will utilize too much of what little resources they have. 
It's an unsustainable process, leading to an eventual degradation and intensification of environmental conditions. The whole process is known as desertification. The land basically deteriorates over time, becoming a harsher and harsher desert. But I should mention that desertification does happen naturally. Severe and persistent droughts occur and, well, they're basically unavoidable, unfortunately. But the intensification of the process has become alarming. Let me walk you through how human activity has affected desertification. Throughout history, the populations of arid and semi-arid regions were small and basically nomadic, balancing survival techniques like hunting and gathering with farming and herding. They moved around a lot in, in their attempts to navigate the irregular seasons, but population growth led to less movement and more farmland, and that farmland needs to be irrigated. Now, all life is essentially dependent on healthy soil. Plants can't grow without it, and without plants, there, uh, there aren't any crops for people or, for that matter, grazing animals. Healthy soil is the result of a few concerted efforts, like heavy composting, rotating crops, chemical fertilizers, sensibly and correctly. And for truly rich soil, there needs to be fungi and microorganisms in the earth, byproducts of organic decay. The break plants and animals provides nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, um, sulfur and phosphorus. Now, those components need to be maintained in the soil in order to farm effectively. That's true anywhere, not just in dry areas. Without proper conservation of healthy soil, we begin to see desertification. Too often, chemical fertilizers are overused, as is what little water is available, sapping the topsoil of those fundamental nutrients. If plants can't draw nutrients from the earth, they don't grow, which means there are few absent of those roots too compact or too loose, resulting in erosion, and that leads to even further desertification. But um, there are also a few other causes. Um, grazing animals can be responsible as well. Livestock like cows and sheep are obviously very important to any robust farming society. But the problem with permitting animals to feed uncontrolled in dry regions with few predators and no migration is that they can quickly eliminate and, like before, without vegetation cover, topsoil is exposed. So we see erosion starting when heavy wind or storms sweep the land. And here's another cause that I know some of you are already thinking of, the reckless clear-cutting of forests. That, too, can set off the desertification process. Trees are needed for securing topsoil and reducing wind erosion. Again, balance. I mean, sustainability is too often disregarded, resulting in still more degradation. And keep in mind that a region and trees only gets hotter and hotter over time. The process doesn't stop with erosion. The stark surface reflects sunlight back into the atmosphere, leading to greater evaporation and less rainfall. So how exactly can be stopped? A big part of the problem is that the society's harsh zones are usually marginalized and um, very poor. Some are even war run from invading militias. They're, well, desperate sometimes. It's only through education, the teaching of sustainable agricultural techniques, education can be slowed or and since treatment of topsoil is key and crop rotation has to be practiced. The planting of cover crops like um, beans and lentils, that's been shown to boost nitrogen in topsoil. Responsible irrigation should also coincide with building terraces in hilly areas. Those terraces look kind of like stairs built into the side of a hill. They help to prevent runoff and erosion. 
Planting more trees in specifically chosen locations can also lessen environmental degradation and help to stabilize the soil. And we're still developing ways to adapt. Conservation ingenuity has resulted in something called arid aquaculture, a method of breeding fish in the salty ponds of certain drylands. So as bleak as all this might seem, there's still plenty of opportunity to overcome it. We're going to listen again, please. Listen to part of a lecture in a class on environmental studies. Often, when we think about deserts, we imagine vast, uninhabitable wastelands that are basically, um, well, uninhabited. But actually, drylands comprise over 40% of over 2 billion people across the globe live within these very tough ecological zones. Obviously, the scarcity of water is a huge issue for any population, big or small. And to survive, people in drylands, uh, these kinds of societies often will utilize too much of what little resources they have. It's an unsustainable process, leading to an eventual degradation and intensification of environmental conditions. The whole process is known as desertification. The land deteriorates over time, becoming a harsher and harsher desert. But I should mention that desertification does happen naturally. Severe and persistent droughts occur and, well, they're basically unfortunately. But the intensification of the process has become alarming. Let me walk you through how human activity has affected desertification. Throughout history, the populations of arid and semi-arid regions were small and basically nomadic, balancing survival techniques like hunting and gathering with farming and herding. They moved around a lot in, in their attempts to navigate seasons, but population growth led to less movement and more farmland and that farmland needs to be irrigated. Now, all life is essentially dependent on healthy soil. Plants can't grow without it, and without plants, there, uh, there aren't any crops for people, or for that matter, grazing animals. Healthy soil is the result of a few concerted efforts, like heavy composting, rotating crops, and using chemical fertilizers sensibly and correctly. Truly rich soil, there needs to be fungi and microorganisms in the earth, byproducts of organic decay. Of dead plants and animals provides nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, and um, sulfur and phosphorus. Now, those components need to be maintained in the soil in order to farm effectively. That's true anywhere, not just in dry areas. Without proper conservation of healthy soil, we begin to see desertification. Too often, chemical fertilizers are used, as is what little water is, tapping the topsoil of those fundamental nutrients. If plants can't draw nutrients from the earth, they don't grow, which means there are fewer root systems. Absent of those roots, the soil becomes too compact or too loose, resulting in erosion and that leads to even further desertification. But um, there are also a few other causes. Um, grazing animals can be responsible as well. Livestock like cows and sheep are obviously very important to any robust farming society. But the problem with permitting animals to feed uncontrolled in dry regions with few predators and no migration is that they can quickly eliminate all plant life and like before, without vegetation cover, topsoil is exposed. So we see erosion starting when heavy wind or, or storms sweep the land. And here's another cause that I know some of you are already thinking of, cutting a forest. That too can set off the desertification process. Trees are needed for securing topsoil and reducing wind erosion. Again, balance. I mean, Sustainability is too often disregarded, resulting in still more degradation. And keep in mind that a region without grasses and trees 
only gets hotter and hotter over time. The process doesn't stop with erosion. The stark surface reflects sunlight back into the atmosphere, leading to greater evaporation and less rainfall. So how exactly can desertification be stopped? A big part of the problem is that the societies living in these zones are usually marginalized and um, very poor and war refugees on the militias. They're, well, desperate sometimes. It's only through education, the teaching of sustainable agricultural techniques, that desertification can be slowed or stopped. Common sense treatment of topsoil is key, and crop rotation has to be practiced. The planting of cover crops, like um, beans and lentils, that's been shown to boost nitrogen in topsoil. Responsible irrigation with building terraces in hilly areas those terraces, uh, they look kind of like stairs built into the side of a hill. They help to prevent runoff and erosion. Planting more trees in specifically chosen locations can also lessen environmental degradation and help to stabilize the soil. And we're still developing ways to adapt. Conservation ingenuity has resulted in something called arid aquaculture, a method of breeding fish in the salty ponds of certain drylands. So as bleak as all this might seem, there's still plenty of opportunity to overcome it. So thank you very much. So let's, let's, uh, let's see. Can you please send me your uh, photos of your notes? Envíenme las fotos de sus notas, por favor, por WhatsApp eh, al grupo. Okay, para que las podamos revisar. Queremos revisar las notas. Okay, so let's wait for Abigail. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'll show the notes right now. Let's see. So here are uh, Armando's. Okay, so the basic thing is that uh, uh, we actually need to cut the, the piece. Uh, okay. When we, if we're doing the, the, the other one, like uh, Abigail did very well. But, and uh, that's very important because of the fact that you can see here that she has a lot of notes here. Okay, thank you very much, Abigail. You did very, very well. Let's see, for instance, here, no migration without vegetation, forest, desert balance, uh, degradation, stop erosion. Okay, oh, <laughs> I, I would say instead of stop, in vez de stop con la O, I pondría STP para poder. Ahorrar unas cuantas palabras. Big part, yeah, muy bien part. Sure. Uh, can you repeat? repetir eso? ¿Qué dice? Perdón, teacher, estuve intentando. Ok, no problem, no problem. Ok, it's great. So, conservation. Opportunity. Okay. So actually, uh, okay. So it's great. So let's let's uh, 
Okay, so we'll have it again, okay? It's very important for me, not... En esta clase lo que queremos es reforzar el tema de las notas, ¿sí? Entonces vamos a escuchar otro más. Sí, quiero ver sus notas. Vamos a ver sus notas, ¿sí? Ocupar tanto en practicar, en responder, porque eso es más para la otra clase, la, la práctica. Sí, en este caso quiero ver sus notas, así que en este caso, Armando, alistaremos una hoja para doblarla, qué sé yo. Y Austrona. Esa chiquita. Voy a sacarla. Bueno. Ok, y Abigail está bien, solo que ahora trataremos de usar menos vocales. Sí, usar menos vocales. Y en este caso solo vamos a escuchar una vez, quiero ver eh, qué tal van sus notas. En este caso, a ver, vamos a venir acá. Listo. Ok, so, va, vamos a escuchar en este caso eh, una vez, por favor, para ver qué tal están sus notas. Listen to part of a lecture in a world history class. Most of you had lunch right before this class, didn't you? Well, I did too. I kept my lunch pretty simple. A sandwich, a cola, and some fruit. And I got to thinking how convenient food is for all of us. We don't have to catch our food or find it. Sometimes we don't even have to prepare it. We can just buy it. But hey, in very ancient times, everyone got their food, well, most of their food, from hunting wild animals and gathering fruits and vegetables that grew naturally. As you probably noticed, hunting and gathering is not the main way most people get their food these days. Instead, we get almost everything we eat from grocery stores, right? And the food you find in the grocery store, or sometimes the ingredients in the food, originally come from farms. But how did farming start? What archaeologists have found is that the origins of agriculture are scattered across. We see evidence of early farming all around the world, starting about 15,000 years ago during the Neolithic age, the time period when humans first began to use tools, create art, Mm, that sort of thing, started to act more like modern humans. So, earlier in the Neolithic, we see signs of agriculture, but only the farming of plants. We see the first signs that plants were actually cultivated, deliberately grown and bred to be different from wild plants. We can tell that the plants were cultivated because they produced more food, better food for human populations, than their wild predecessors. The grain plants yielded more grain. The fruit trees grew bigger fruits. And the seeds more closely resembled the seeds of modern domestic plants. You see, even hunter-gatherers would sometimes care for wild plants, water a tree, or grow berry bushes. But real agriculture began to grow their own plants, leading them to be different from wild ones. And in the early to mid-Neolithic, we see this up in a lot of different places. Cultivated rice in Central Asia, selectively bred squash in Mesoamerica, figs and grain in the Middle East. But that was just plants. You see, I mean, mainly plants. Another key part of human agriculture, the farming of animals, didn't come till later. Oh, sure, there was some limited domestication earlier in the Neolithic, some taming of dogs, sheep, goats, but this was a very minor aspect of farming at first. As agriculture continued into the late Neolithic, we saw farm animals take center stage alongside plants. Humans started breeding the smaller animals, the dogs, sheep, goats, more than ever. And the animals became more different from wild animals than before. Sheep began to grow more wool for farmers' clothing. Goats were bred to give more milk and give to produce more meat. Farm dogs began to have the instinct to herd animals, not hunt them, the way wild dogs would. Remember, this is one of the first signs of true agriculture, selectively cultivating plants and selectively breeding animals. Animals began to become very important. Humans 
even began to develop pastoral communities, groups of people who all worked together to tend animals for food. With more people working together to manage farm animals, there was an especially noticeable rise in two types of animals that can be a lot of work, cows and pigs. Beef, pork, dairy. The stuff lots of farms all over the world still churn out today. This is where farming really came together, with pastoral communities. Farming as a whole started to take on the basic features of modern agriculture. People began to organize communities around farming and around systems that distributed the farmed food, gave the food to everyone in the community. These were uh, small settlements at first, but soon pastoral communities turned into something far bigger, cultural civilization, based on the farming of both animals and plants, started happening on a large scale. We started to see lots of states with governments and modern social organization based on agricultural food production. There were rulers who made the laws about how and where the food was grown and how it was distributed. There were various specialists to grow food, store food, prepare food, manage animals or plants, make farming tools, build roads and buildings, and so on. People finally began organizing into complex societies like the ones we have today. Okay, so let's send, please, your notes. Let's see your notes in WhatsApp again, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I was mute. Ok, perdón, estaba muteado, estaba hablando. Ok, entonces... Eh, sí, entonces... Eh, ok, so here uh, I'm seeing that in the note... Uh, very well. A ver, ¿qué consejos? Por ejemplo, acá en food, tal vez yo solo anotaría con solo una O, así se ahora, digamos. Pero después está muy bien esto de... Stores. Esto de acá es stores, ¿verdad, Armando? Sí. Excelente. Muy bien. Acá tal vez este limited igual haría LMTD. Limited. Rocks, fruits, seeds. Ok. Uh, agriculture and food. Este, este ant tal vez lo haría como una especie de un símbolo así, ¿no? Tal vez para que sea más farming tools. Ok. Este no estaba tan difícil. Vamos a ver. Eh, el siguiente de Abigail the food years ago very well very well box agriculture box uh, ok ok muy bien ¿qué opinas Abigail? ¿te ha servido esto? o sea ¿realmente has podido ahorrar tiempo? Mm, maybe I, I... Creo que necesito practicar un poco más. Ok. Ok, so we're going to practice one more time, please. We're going to practice one. Uh, 
this uh, this taking notes okay for today and then next class we're gonna see the uh, but first so everybody here has the anki do you have yes the anki today? okay yes, okay yes. so uh, yes so please uh, please uh, I'll, uh, uh, por favor, envíenme una foto de su aquí, de su, un screenshot, si es de celular, o una foto de su computadora hasta mientras. Voy a estar poniendo, me voy a anotar que ustedes ya tienen el Anki. Ok, y hasta mientras voy a estar poniendo el siguiente. Again, to the listening section, we're gonna see one more task. And we're gonna see the notes, okay? Who takes better notes? Listen to part of a lecture in a class on environmental studies. Often, when we think about deserts, we imagine vast, uninhabitable wastelands that are basically, um, well, uninhabited. But actually, dry lands comprise Excuse me, teacher, I can hear. I ah, can't perdón. hear. Sí, sí, no, es, 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 no, este ya habíamos hecho. Sí, este ya habíamos hecho. Eh, vamos a poner otro. Ok, perdón, estaba muteado, estaba diciendo eso, pero estaba muteado. Vamos a poner otro. Este ya estoy poniendo al azar para de una vez irme a la siguiente. Ok, so... Uh, Marcelo, could, could you lend us the, the account of my wish to practice? Uh, yes, of course. I'll send you the the account. Okay, thank you. No, no problem. Okay, so uh, here it is. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, There is the account and the password, okay? So you can practice. Normalmente cambiamos el password cada mes, o sea que practique todo lo que pueda hasta fin de febrero, sí. Okay. Pero ya Thank you. Todo. Thanks. No problem. Okay, so uh, we're going to go here. And, okay, here it is. Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. I want to talk about a topic that all of us here on Earth have probably thought about in some way at some time or another. That would be the likelihood of life on other planets. Scientists refer to a planet's ability to develop and sustain life as planet habitability. Planet habitability can be calculated using basic data that we believe to be accurate about far-off planets. They are the same factors that make Earth habitable to us humans. They combine to storm, if you will, for conditions that are essential in fostering life. But not only must several of these conditions be met, they must be just right. First, a planet needs to be, um, to be terrestrial. This means it's made of rock and metal and is not a gas planet, like Jupiter is in our solar system. It's are too low in mass with too little gravity to hold an atmosphere, the protective shield that insulates a planet. For example, Earth's atmosphere is roughly 170 kilometers thick, keeping the surface and warm, and also protected from the sun's radiation. But a planet like Venus, our next-door neighbor, has an atmosphere 100 than Earth's, made of greenhouse gases, so Venus is way too hot and toxic to be habitable. Terrestrial planets also have volcanoes and geologic activity, unlike gaseous planets, which are to organisms. 
Since all terrestrial planets have the same basic chemical makeup, we know nutrients are present. Nutrients are essential for planet habitability because they build and maintain the bodies of all living things. Of nutrients and their circulation, a habitable planet also requires liquid water and a water cycle. Actually, the presence of liquid water is the most important factor in determining planet habitability. A planet too close to its sun or too far away is not capable of supporting liquid water, and, and it's immediately disqualified from supporting life. Liquid water is a solvent essential in uh, biochemical reactions. It transports chemicals inside an organism's cells and throughout the body. Without liquid water, an organism's cells won't receive or be able to dissolve the chemicals that they need for energy and growth. A planet might still be considered habitable even on drought, which can cause life to become latent, that is, uh, inactive. But for activity to start back up sooner or later, water has to become available again. The energy able to be derived, uh, able to be harnessed from light or chemical, a large factor in planet habitability. Earth is placed in its solar system with a steady influx of sunlight, but not too much or too little, like the case with planets too close or too far from the sun. Just like nutrients, lighter chemical energy gives organism cells the ability to run their processes. For example, iron and sulfur are two chemicals that are essential in providing energy to cells. Remember that light energy can be too great. Think of harmful rays such as ultraviolet. On the other hand, iron and sulfur and other energy providing chemicals Having too many chemicals like that are a problem. Now, a planet's temperature also has to be in a certain range in order to sustain life. The speed of the movement of atoms and molecules. If it's too cold, chemical activity is slow and it's basically ineffective. But too much heat, well, that causes genetic material to disintegrate. Keep in mind the important water cannot be frozen or evaporate as will happen on a planet that's too cold or too hot. Earth is the only planet in our solar system with a temperature range capable of sustaining life, though the interior of some of the terrestrial planets and moons could possibly be in this range. Mars shows signs of once supporting liquid water, and it even has ice at its polar caps. Still, it lacks the definitive factors that make a planet habitable. As you can probably see, planet habitability is a tricky process. We have to consider carefully the exact, the precise features of a planet. And even then, all this assumes that organisms on other planets are carbon-based, like we are. Earth does offer an impressive example of what's possible when such fine circumstances are met. All of these hypotheses surrounding planet habitability are built around what we know about Earth. Of course, it's always possible for unknown organisms to be utterly uncharacteristic, living in a scenario of habitability that's completely dissimilar to our own, one that we would consider incapable of supporting life. Okay, so please can you send your notes to the WhatsApp group? Por favor, envíen sus notas. Vamos a revisar si es que están mejor o no. Okay. Liquid water. Tal vez en liquid water, tal vez yo pondría LQD liquid water. Water está muy bien abreviado. Water está muy bien abreviado. Water y run. Okay. Uh, and ice water. Ok, está bien, está mucho mejor. Vamos a ver el siguiente. Este está muy, muy bien. Este me gusta harto. Earth. Nutrients. Ok. Ok, that's it. Ok, thank you very much. 
Entonces, eso sería la siguiente clase. Vamos a ver, por favor, lo que es... Eh, quiero que igual en el Anki solo practiquen la 2, ¿verdad? La 2 de spelling, porque hay varios cards. He visto que están practicando vocabulary. Ese no practiquen, sí. Solo la 2 y la de sinónimos más, que es la 4. La 2 y la 4, por favor. Sí, la 2 y la 4 estaremos practicando. Voy a mandar una votación y con eso puede, pueden irse. Es la votación anónima. Eh, después de finalizar, pueden irse de la clase.